Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of From the Suggestion Box, Navigating Feedback, the Good, the Bad, and the Say What? I am so excited to have my esteemed guest today, and in my personal opinion, a bit of a mentor, Mr. Jerome Tenniel. How are you this morning? I'm doing very well, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, but also, thanks for that that you know that note. Um, I, you know, I don't generally think of myself as a mentor, um, but I I always like to hear that the things that I'm sharing are of value. So thank you for that note. Absolutely, absolutely. And I just I want to thank you because there's so many I want can't, I can't say so many times, but the times that I've just picked up and I'm like Jerome, I need your I need your insight, I need your <laughs> advice, and. What I've love always loved about you is that you straight from you you shoot straight from the hip. So it wasn't always necessarily everything I wanted to hear, but is what I needed to hear, and that set me straight. And so I just I thank you for that. I thank you for that. I thank you for that. <laughs> well, Jerome, I couldn't imagine anybody not knowing who you are. But for those, you know, maybe three or four people who are new to volunteer engagement, um. Why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do? Yeah, so I'll start with sort of the iteration that I'm in right now professionally, and I'll sort of give you a little bit of background of how I sort of got here. Um, so I generally talk about myself as a social impact professional. Um, you know, I've been in the social impact space for more than a decade now, and for uh, a majority of the most recent half of that, I've been uh, focused on corporate responsibility or corporate citizenship, corporate social responsibility, whatever nomenclature you want to assign to it. Right. Um, but um, but even though I work with corporations now and, and how they're designing their own corporate volunteer programs, corporate philanthropy, what have you, um, I actually started as a volunteer coordinator um, in 2012 for a national 501c3 at the lowest bottom rung of the totem pole, as you could possibly imagine, that I think some of your listeners might find themselves. Uh -huh. uh, and then before my social impact career, I was actually in the military for uh, between the year uh, 2004 to 2012. So um, that's sort of where I got my first introduction to a line of work that I felt was duty oriented and purpose driven. Uh -huh. and then leaving the military service in 2012. Um, it became sort of another extension on how do I continue to serve my country outside of the uniform? Mm, I love that. I love that. And thank you for your service. Um, okay, so good. I'm glad we laid that foundation because I want to dive right in. Everybody, today we are talking about the book. <laughs> Everybody knows about the book. Um, I am really excited um, to to get your insights like straight from you um i have the book here yes because i have the book too um yes. <laughs> transforming <laughs> disruption to impact so i have so many questions let's just start with where did this idea come from and how did you all and how did you all go from idea to product because every day a lot of people have a lot of ideas about what they want to do but we never see the end product of it but you all were able to do it and with so many collaborators how where do, let me start right there where did the idea come from <laughs> yeah so um i'll always i generally preface everything that i talk about re related to the book is saying it's not my book. I think of it more of a, of a book project. Um, and I was actually brought in um, later on in the project. Um, well, so so my my partners, so Beth Steinhorn, Craig Young, Doug Bolton, um, I think the book, it actually started with Beth and Craig. And, mm. um, and they were, they had this sort of big, hairy, audacious goal in putting something out into the world. And as their conversations continue, they were like, let's, let's get a book together. Let's create, let's put everything in a book. And, um, and over that time, they brought in uh, uh, Doug and also uh, myself. And so the, you know, the four of us, um, we, you know, we had thought through the outline, the different pieces of content that need to exist in this 
uh, in what we're thinking as sort of a revolutionary book about the profession and different challenges and obstacles, but then how people have reimagined, uh, you know, the practice of volunteer engagement and really thought through methodically, like, who are the the leading voices that we want to have in here? Who are those that, you know, that we believe are on the cutting edge of talking about the profession in the field and, and how we sort of exist, but then also elevating some voices of those who, you know, are not as often, um, uh, uh, you know, known um, in the field and in the profession. And so we wanted to make sure that we also got a good cross section of different sectors, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you work in corporate responsibility and you design corporate volunteer programs or whether you work for AmeriCorps or national service, um, or you're in the nonprofit sector or are thinking about things from more um, um, advocacy and grass, you know, grassroots uh, engagement when you're thinking about uh, informal volunteer engagement. Uh, so we want to make sure that we had a vessel that could capture all of those different points. Um, and so I think we have uh, approximately or more than 20 uh, leaders across the social impact space who were able to provide their their insights and their opinions and and expertise on the various um topics that that we felt were important to to pull out and and share with the world and so i think of it as you know of course my my voice is captured in that and okay. and uh, you know obviously with the uh editorial revisions that we've made um you know you can see sort of my fingerprints throughout um, but it's a book project, right? right? And I think for me, what makes the book so special is not necessarily my voice. I think the the collection of voices that we have is far more important than just my voice alone. And so, uh, so that's why that's why the book and that sort of gives you sort of insight of where I was pulled in and and some of the some of the sausage making behind the scenes. Yeah, and. I'm glad that you mentioned it like that. One of the things that I had loved about it, because obviously when I saw the book and I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to get this and I'm going to read it through. But then realizing it was more like a collection of articles yeah. and just different perspectives, different, um, different types of situations, like you said, different industries. And so what I loved about it is it was almost kind of like, um, almost kind of like a guide to where you would you don't necessarily have to sit and read it all the way through but if there's a situation that comes up it's almost kind of like oh i can go through and find something about this type of situation look that up and read the article as it pertains to it although i still encourage everybody just to sit and read all the way through it but i like how it was divided up um according to what you needed at that moment and then you could go and pick it out as needed. I really liked that. Yeah, we wanted it to be less of a how-to. You know, we wanted it to not be a how-to book, but we also wanted to leave readers with sort of an actionable item or thing that they can springboard and do after every single essay. So that's why every single, you know, essay that exists in there has some like key takeaways, things that are immediately actionable, that are tangible, that you can like put into action if 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 you so choose, um, uh, while also being more um, um, more focused on you know what the situation was, what was the action, and what was the the end result or the positive takeaway that everybody could also be inspired to think about in terms of incorporating those types of new practices into their own programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just thinking of this question off the top of my head. So forgive me, because otherwise I would have done my research ahead of time. Yeah, go for it. Um, in the collection of authors that are in here, um, I'm just going to be frank. Are you the only person of color that um, contributed? No. Okay. Okay. No, That's good. No. Yeah, and you know, and if and if I'm sort of like sort of recalling and and thinking back through all the authors, you know, I can say that there's you know hindsight is twenty twenty, and there's always a better opportunity or greater opportunity to be very deliberate in elevating 
people of color, but I, I, I would also say that I wasn't the only person of color who contributed, uh, although I would say that the demographic makeup are largely more reflecting of the field itself demographically. Right, right. And and that's okay. I'm always uh I'm always 50-50 on things. Um I always I all I don't always necessarily feel you should have to force something because sure. if you if you're looking for um advice and things that work, you want to get it from the people who are doing it. You don't want to force something just because. But it's also nice to know that different perspectives are being brought in. And so you get a taste of it's not just all one perspective and maybe that's just the only way that it works. Um, so I'm I'm glad, I'm glad about that. I was going to transition into some other things, but before we do, is there anything else that you want to mention or make sure that people know or understand about the book? I don't want to go too much in it because I want people sure. to buy it and read and go into the topics themselves. So I don't want to give away too much on here, but is there anything else that you want to make sure that people know about the book before we transition? Yeah, of course. Yeah. One of the things that we wanted to to make sure um, that the book was is that it was also inclusive or that it would also appeal to those who might not necessarily work in volunteer engagement. So mm. whether, whether you're a CEO or executive director of a community center or a nonprofit institution, or whether you work in academia and you're looking for uh, salient points about, you know, nonprofit management as it pertains to curriculum, or whether you work for a for-profit company in corporate responsibility, or it is your secondary duty as the HR representative to to manage employees in, in volunteering activities for your corporation, like the book is for you. I would even say that the book is even um, relevant and useful for the passionate volunteer who wants to be more involved civically uh, with their nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations that they support. Um, so it's a book for everybody. Uh, it's not solely for the practitioner. Right. And I, I like that you brought that up um, for a couple of reasons, because I know um, I know a lot of organizations these days have entity groups or uh, ERGs, just uh, employee readiness groups. Right. Different yeah, acronyms for. yeah. <laughs> right. So um, so thinking of what a great thing to have, um, like, so if your organization does have something like that, that could be a part of the education process. It can be book clubs. I know there's been, um, I was just talking to Susan Sanow the other day and how they were having a book club and and you and Beth joined the book club. That's amazing. Um, but just having that opportunity to have those discussions. And that's the other thing that I really like about the book is that it brings up things and it gets you thinking and it allows for discussion and it allows to um, allows for people to come together, think about things, toy around with things, get new ideas, and um, how to think by the time you're done reading the book, you're looking and thinking at things differently. Like one of the things for me, like I said, without giving away too much, probably spoiler alert right here, <laughs> um, just rethinking um, service on Martin Luther King Day. Like that was, I just think more and more and more and more people need to hear about the perspective that was there. Um, because it was definitely something that I've always shared, but it was one of those things where uh, my my uh, former boss used to always say, "Say the um, say the quiet things out loud." It was all the things that sometimes we would be thinking, but we would never say it out loud. And I was like, "Ah, somebody's finally saying it out loud." Yeah, yeah, understood. And and I'll also say that, um, and this is maybe for future discussion or future book club, but there are a lot of things that just, again, didn't make it into the book itself because guess what? There are only so many pages uh, within the book, but, um, but yeah, um, I, I appreciate your, your making that point. And um, I hope others will also find um, little nuggets and uh, value within. So let me, okay. So maybe I wasn't quite done with the book. So I'm going to think, I'm going to talk more, not so much the content, but just even the log logistics. There was several different um, contributors. So mm -hmm. 
when you are all trying to put this thing together, does everybody have like a deadline? Everybody has to get it. Like, how were you all all yes. able to make all of that happen? Because I know the more people in a project, the more challenging it can be. How did you all work all of that out? <laughs> Yeah, so um, we worked with the publisher, so Amplify, uh, Amplify Publishing Group, and when we're working, when um, and this is one experience working with the publisher, but in this particular instance, working with them, um, we were able to say, okay, when do we want to have the book published, and then working our way backwards from that, how do we? What are the deadlines? When do when do certain pieces of content need to be in? What does your editorial review process look like? And we just worked our way backwards from that. And so we had very very clear and deliberate deadlines from every piece of content, every piece of outreach that we would make to a contributor, and then also making it very clear: here are the expectations, here are the deadlines. And and making sure that we're holding ourselves and them accountable to meet mm -hmm. deadlines because when one deadline is missed, then all of a sudden your 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 you know the the print date all of a sudden is two weeks beyond where you want it to be. Right. Um, and so um, it was. We all had different roles and responsibilities in that process. So we had, uh, for example, um, you know, Doug was one. Um, you know, I think he's got a he's got a, a more of traditional media background. And so, you know, he managed a lot of the author communications back and forth with all the different contributors. So we all played very different roles. Um, what most people don't realize is even though we have a book, right, we have the book, we actually had to form an LLC to create the entire process so, mm. so you know we're all business like true business partners under the same llc and we all have very different roles in that business um and a part of that was how we worked with our contributors and how we worked with the publisher and and the communications and marketing all of it okay so that brings up a whole nother question then sure so we were talking a little bit earlier and you had mentioned earlier that um, there's only but so many pages you can only do but so much so with you all having to create that entity was it just to be able to produce this or do you see like a part two because if there was if that was if there was that um, much great content that wasn't able to make it do you see a, a part two to be able to include all of that <laughs> Um, you like, know, or can you say that here <laughs> here's so um so I'll, I'll preface all this by saying the book has only been in storefronts since November of last year. So we're still in our infancy of yeah. getting the book out there. Um, I'm not ready to close the door on what might be, uh, you know, a, a part two on that. Um, I don't even know if we've even considered what the next iteration or an iteration of this is yet. Um, but what I will share, and this is sort of personally, this is has nothing to do with this particular book itself, but um, I'm certainly creating a book that is solely uh, me and my voice and my experiences. And so um, I'm, I'm, I, I suspect that there will be elements within that book that just didn't make it into this one, but might be pulling from very similar experiences um, whether it was, you know, uh, when I was working as an in-house uh, CSR professional or back in the nonprofit sector uh, as a volunteer coordinator. So so there are certainly elements uh, that are going to be in that particular book um, that may have never seen a light of day in, in a book like this um, that was uh, very focused and um, had more contributors than just one. Nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Because as soon as you said LLC, my, like my my entrepreneur brain just went, whoa, the, just like the world of possibilities that could come out of that. My brain was, took off. So I'm back now. I'm back now. Cause part of me was wondering how does that work? How did all that? So, but um, that really tied the, it connected it for me, the LLC mm -hmm. part that really connected it for me. Um, Okay, now I, now I think I'm done talking about the book. I think I'm, I'm done. It might creep back up. Um, but I'm going to transition 
a little bit um, and just talk about Jerome Tenniel, the person. Um, and I want to ask you a question and listen, if you don't want to answer it, <laughs> I'll have you and I'll totally just, you know, edit it out. It's all good. But sure, go for it. Um, just from in the, I also want to preface this by saying um, I don't necessarily like to make race a big part of anything that I'm doing because I feel like it can um, it can be distracting. It can take away from the the genuineness of whatever it is that you are trying to talk about and understand. But sometimes, I mean, it just is what it is, right? Sure. So from one brown person to another brown person in the industry where, where we know what how the demographic the demographic normally stacks up, but also with you being a male and a person of color in this profession, you, it is just rare. Um, how does that affect you in any way? Does it bother you in any way? Like what, how does, I mean, I just have always wanted to just talk to you about that because as, uh, as often as you may not necessarily well, I can talk about like for me personally. I'm like, I don't, like I said, I don't like necessarily to make race the thing, but there's nothing like walking in the room and you're one of the only ones as a, as a female. Yeah. And then, and because we barely have males in this profession to begin with. And then being a, a male person of color on top of that, like what, what is that like for you? So I, I got a couple different answers. So so I'm thinking about this from like different iterations in, in my career and like where that's gotten me today. Um, if I'm thinking about the moment in which I was, you know, I had the the title of volunteer coordinator, manager of volunteer services or something to that effect in a nonprofit sector um, as a man of color, I would say that that being a chosen profession and something that I identify as a chosen profession, I would say that um, I felt like more often than not, I was the only person of color in the room in that sort of sphere of nonprofit volunteer coordinator. Um, as my career has progressed and, you know, I made the transition from nonprofit you know, volunteer engagement to working in corporate responsibility, I would say that the 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 challenges didn't really change. And what I mean by that is even the professional corporate responsibility is it lacks diversity. Mm. Um, there are very, very similar um uh, very similar demographic makes a uh, makeup between nonprofit volunteer engagement. And those who work in corporate responsibility, um, most and, and this isn't like this isn't like a newsflash. I think what we saw um, is that there has been research. So the Association of Corporate Citizenship Professionals (ACCP) they commissioned research um, that was uh, that was published last year, and the findings are they validated our suspicions and the suspicions were is that it's you know largely like uh, csr and corporate citizenship leadership positions are largely held by uh cis white women or those who identify as caucasian european descent mm -hmm. that's the same as in nonprofit volunteer engagement right um so so that's something that it hasn't really changed um I would say that I'm very optimistic and hopeful that that we're going to be able to make the profession. And when I say the profession, I mean more broadly um, make the profession, whether it's a nonprofit engagement or whether it's corporate responsibility, more diverse. And I think, you know, there's um, there are some active efforts to really do that. Um, how does it make me feel? That's a that's a different question. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's made my job harder, you know? And again, that's like anecdotal, right? Like people, you know, and, and when, when you, when you see research and you, 
hear from people of color about the microaggressions that they experience or the different levels or degrees of discrimination, whether it's intentional or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, when I think back through the work that I've done, I don't know, I can't, there's not a thing that I can point to that says, well, this experience, like that was definitely a negative experience. I don't know that I have those types of experiences. Um, I've always operated in this environment um, just as I always have, right? Like the the color of my skin has never changed since Mm -hmm. I was born. So (laughs) the way that I navigated high school, the way that I navigated the military, the way that I navigated the nonprofit sector and corporate responsibility are all fairly the same. Like I don't change in that moment. And I don't know that it's made my work harder. I also don't know if it's made it easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and here's what I mean is like, especially as a person of color, you know, like if if you're applying for a particular job, you know, like I identify as what I identify as. And so, you know, I, am I the check in the block for a hiring manager right. to fill their quota? I'm not sure, right? Um, I don't think that I've obtained jobs solely because of the color of my skin, but I actually, I actually don't know that. Like I, so I, I operate in this world, sort of, as I have for the last, you know, thirty-seven years of my life, and I don't know if it's made it harder, um, but I, I, but in those moments where I go to a conference, where I go to a meeting where I go to what have you, um, I'm very, very aware of the makeup in the room. I'm Mm -hmm. very aware of it because I've been made aware of it most of my life. Right. Um, So I'm aware of it. I don't necessarily change how I operate in those moments. Um, But it's also changed you know, it's interesting, you know, there are a lot of folks within my network and within my circle and people who have, I've engaged with and interacted with professionally and personally, who will say, you know, hey, because you're, because you're a man of color, this is what you have to do. Hmm. Or they'll say, and, and it's, and it's like, it's like good advice. Like it's, Hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's, hey, here's how you can navigate and, you know, avoid buzzsaws and rakes. Okay. And then I've also had people who say, hey, because you're a man of color, this is what you have to do. And like those suggestions and how to na- navigate those environments. I'm like, I'm not going to do that at all. Like, yeah. <laughs> like you're, you're essentially telling me to not be myself. Like, right. You know, um, and so, yeah. So I don't know that it's made my, my job harder. Um, I would say that it's given me a different perspective in how I do my job. Um, I think simply because I have lived experiences that others will never, will never have. Right. Right, right. Um, And, and those are directly related to where I lived, you know, um, you know, being born and raised in, in Los Angeles in the, uh, in the late eighties and nineties, living in a black community, living through the Los Angeles riots. Right. So there are things that are, that other people will never have experience because of they just have very different life experiences in part because of who they are. Right. Right. Um, and what I'm, what I hear as you're talking, um, it, there, there's, um, this lady that I look up to tremendously. And, um, one of the things that she has said is that excellence knows no color. So when you do what you need to do, like that will typically outshine anything else because if people need a great job done, then they just need a great job done. And it often doesn't really matter who's doing it. They're going to pick the person who's, who is giving them the results that they need for the most part, right? We are not always on the other end of that choosing spectrum. So we don't know a hundred percent, but, um, but it's just definitely something to to think about 
right? And I don't know when she said that it just it hit like a like a pound of bricks in a good way, you know. She's like, "Excellence knows no color," and I was like, "Man, that's that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement." So you are also consulting now, right? Yeah. So um, so uh, about a year ago, I decided to join a consulting firm. And so uh, Uplift uh, or the Uplift Agency, uh, we are a full service social impact and sustainability and ESG consulting firm. So we work with uh, corporate clients to help them navigate the social and environmental landscape uh, and, and essentially helping them uh, walk the talk in terms of how they're designing their programs to be more um, socially and environmentally conscious and responsible in how they're operating their companies. Um, and so I've been a consultant now for, I guess I'm trying to do all the math in my head. It's been since April of last year. So if you can do that math, it's been over more than a year now. But the the interesting thing is like when I think about like my career progression, I served in the military, so the Department of Defense. <laughs> um, I was in a nonprofit sector. I worked for a large, you know, uh, a large brand as a corporate responsibility professional. And now I work for a consulting firm. So I've, I've essentially done three different, <laughs> uh, three different career pivots. Um, and in some ways have been able to continue living out what I feel is my professional purpose at the same time. Well, and the good thing about that is you have the perspective of all three. So anybody who's coming to talk to you, if they're coming from you for the corporate angle, you got them. If they're coming for you strictly nonprofit, you got them. If they come in government, you got it. So, I mean, sometimes I think it's really um, beautiful when life just kind of works out like that. And it kind of seems like the same for you in this particular. You weren't thinking one day I'm going to have this consulting job and I need to make sure I can experience in all these different industries. But it just all kind of came together. It was like, this is who you are. It was who you were supposed to be. And it's all like coming to fruition. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting how things have sort of worked out. Like when I was in the military, there was a point in time where I was like, I don't think I'll ever leave the military. And then I did. <laughs> and, then when I was, and then when I was in the nonprofit sector, like, you know, steep learning curve, trying to become a volunteer coordinator from military service and trying to figure out like, what is it? I had to figure out what my job was and then I had to figure out how to do it well after I figured out how to do the job itself. Um, there was a moment in time where I was like, oh, like I've I've arrived at what I think is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, and then I was like, oh, but there's this other thing over here where I can do the same thing, but I can do it for a large corporation. Like, why don't I explore that? And then, um, you know, like there there was a point in time where I was like, I'd, I'll never be a consultant. And then obviously, and then, that, here you are. That, that sort of <laughs> but like every single moment, every career moment that I've had every chapter if you want to call it that it's it's added a new tool or it's it's strengthened a muscle or um or the alternative of all that is like let's be real like not everything is you know puppies and rainbows right um there are things where I'm like oh that thing that I did once before I never want to do that I never want to do that again right so you learn these things and then over time you're able to sort of better hone in on the things yes. that like give you the most joy in those moments um you know I, I don't know if I'll be consultant for the rest of my life but I do know that for now like it's what I really love and I really really enjoy yeah um, there might come a time that I'm just like, nah, like this is, it's, it's time to, it's time to end this part of my career. Um, but I, you know, but again, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I remember when I left the nonprofit sector and started working for a large brand as a CSR professional. And I remember I had been on the job for maybe a month mm -hmm. and I was at a holiday party and um, I was meeting a, um, so a, a colleague of mine, uh, at the time, Karen, she was introducing me to her husband and he was asking me how I enjoyed the job. And I, re I remember sitting there in that moment, having been on the job for a month. And I was like, man, this is a dream job. And I remember in that moment, he said, well, it's time to look for another dream, man. Oh, and, wow. And I didn't, and I didn't understand what he was saying at the moment. Cause I was like, can I just, can I just enjoy this? Enjoy dream? this? <laughs> uh, yeah. 
right? But that's not what he meant. What he was, what he meant is sort of what I'm talking about now. Is like there'll there'll come a time where the dream is no longer a dream, and now then it'll be it'll be something else that you want to eyeball and to try to figure out how, how you make progress to achieve that next dream while at the same time experiencing the one that you're living right now. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that was a dream job back in 2000. I got what that was 2017. Um, and it, yeah, it ceased to be a dream at some point and look for a different dream. Yeah. <laughs> I love what you said because I often um, mentor uh, people who are coming up in like in good careers, not just in volunteer engagement, but just in general. And and a lot of times when you ask them, they're like, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, intern somewhere or find something out. I was like, because finding out what you don't like to do is just as important as finding out what you do like to do. Because it will, like you said, it will guide you to where you need to be. And you know that if that was something that you couldn't stand, if it comes around again, you, you know, good and well, you know, run, (laughs) you know, run for the hills. I'm not doing that because it's just as important. It's just as important um, to help guide you to where you're trying to go. So, all right. So I, as you said, like you would get to a point and then you pivot, get to a point get, and then you pivot. For people who are listening, who maybe they're at a point where they're like, hmm, I'm just really not even sure if this is what I want to do. Like, how did you know it was time to shift? It was time to change. Um, so this requires a level of self-awareness, mm. a high degree of self-awareness. Um, you have to be able to identify and understand when you're not growing. Mm. Mm. And if if you can't do that, and if you can't be honest about it, then it's hard to figure out when it's time to like move on to something different. Um, you know, whether it was leaving the nonprofit sector to corporate responsibility and then leaving a big brand to, to become a consultant to work with many other brands. Um at every moment in those changes, I identified that I wasn't growing. So my professional muscles were atrophying. Mm-hmm. And I also recognized the same time that I was I was no longer being challenged. And there were other things that I needed to explore in order to you know, to, uh, to satisfy my own, like growth mindset, and, you know, the, my own intellectual curiosity. Um, and so I think once you, once you figure that out, right, once you have that moment of clarity that you're like, I'm no longer growing, I need to be challenged, and what else is there? that's when that's when you have to make a decision on that what whatever that next thing is um yeah that's probably the 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 most simplistic answer uh, you know obviously throughout that entire period there there were different moments where I was like it, it's time to make it it's time to make a change mm-hmm. uh, but i would also say that i i never made a change without fulfilling whatever commitment that I felt like I had set off and, 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 and made. Right. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is mm-hmm. when I left the nonprofit sector, you know, I had built a national volunteer program. Um, I had created a foundation of a body of work, a, a thing that existed there that could be handed off to another person yes. in the absence. Yes. Um, when I left you know, when I, when I left corporate responsibility, um, it was at a moment where the processes and procedures, the guidelines, the toolkits, the, the programs that had been built in my, you know, it, it, when I was there were at a point where the, ab- my, my leaving and the absence of me being there was not going to like devastate them. It wasn't going to devastate the brand or the team. It could Mm -hmm. be something 
Because that was I was able to wrap a bow on it and say, okay, this is it. This is this is actually a really good time for me to transition out, and here's why. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's that there's that as well, right? It, it's um, I I I always made that the mental note to say I'm going to leave a place better than when I found it yes so there so there are two elements of that right it's not like you just are just like oh I'm done I'm I've I've I'm no longer being challenged I'm going to bounce right that's not that's not what I'm talking about what I'm talking about is a couple different moments where you're like I've I've finished the work that I've committed to do and now it's time for me to look for somewhere else because I'm no longer growing and I'm no longer being stimulated the way that I need to be in order to, to function fully and to perform at my best. Um, and I think, you know, um, and again, I, I'm sharing that with the assumption that it's not a negative or toxic. Right. 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 Like, uh, obviously, if, you know, if you only like less than half of your job, then it's probably not the right job for you. Right. Right. But we're not talking about an instance like that. We're talking about an instance where you say, it's time for me to look elsewhere. The other thing I would sort of share too, is, you know, I think one of the things that we certainly see like in our profession is there's a lot of turnover. So, Mm -hmm. so the, the, you know, the, the other part of this too, is like, while I chose to no longer be a volunteer coordinator, or manager of volunteer services in the nonprofit sector, um, every career pivot that I've made since then, I've still been involved in the profession. Mm-hmm. I've mm-hmm. just, it, it's just the, the work that I do is taken on a different dimension. And my ability to support the field has changed as I've elevated in seniority and also increased influence in other networks that I didn't originally have access to when I was a volunteer coordinator back in 2013 yeah. time frame right so that's the other part of it too is like I think especially in this in in the field of volunteer engagement we get wrapped up with the question of when should I leave should I leave is it good for the profession if I leave okay. because of the turnover issue um but like I don't know that I'll ever want to be a volunteer coordinator again. There's nothing wrong with that. But like my goal is to be a VP or a senior VP somewhere. And I can always make sure that I'm supporting the mechanisms that engage volunteers with a different influence, with a different thinking, with a different perspective, you know, um, where I I didn't possess any of those things as a volunteer coordinator doing the day-to-day work. So and that's the other, I, I think the other thing that people will have to sort of grapple with is like, did I leave the profession? Not really. I mean, I'm not a volunteer coordinator, but like, I'm still advocating for the profession, albeit with a different influence and a different perspective and and uh, and, and a different audience that matter of factly need to have some value on the profession itself, whether or not they know it. Yeah, no, that makes that's all good stuff. That's good stuff. I have a question to you. I want to pose a question to you to something that you said just a little bit ago. And if somebody hears this, because I've heard people ask this before, um, when you, like you said, uh, right before you're getting ready to leave, it's like, everything was kind of like up and running and like, you were able to wrap it in a bow and hand it over. And you were able to create systems and things in such a way that, not only like if you left, it's not devastating over like if you went on a month vacation, everything would work well. So I know I've heard some people say, well, if I set things up in such a way that it was working so great that I don't have to be there, aren't I like pushing myself out of a job? Like, what would you say to somebody who has that thought? Um, I would say the answer to that is maybe, but not in the way that they might think. And here's what I mean by it. I think we, and I, so I'm just sort of saying we is sort of just like everybody, we ought to get out of this scarcity mindset that okay. by me performing jo- my job well, I'm going to put myself out of a job. Um, I mean, <laughs> technically you might be, but like, you know, 
that's not necessarily a bad thing. And here's what I mean. It's like every time, and, and there have been multiple iterations of, of having direct reports, whether it's in the military or the nonprofit sector or at, you know, you know, for a, lar a large brand. Um, in those instances, as, as a manager of others, I have a responsibility to develop the people who are coming after me to take my spot. Yes. I need, at some point I got to move on and other people are going to do my job, maybe even do it better than I did. Right. Um, so there's a, there's a responsibility that you have to not just your employer, not just the people who might work for you or with you um, to, to set them up in a way that makes you less needed it makes them less dependent on you um in order to to get to that point like you have to stop operating with a scarcity mindset for self-preservation right i think self-preservation can sometimes be one of the most devastating things in any workplace yeah uh, i see it a lot in corporate responsibility where you know senior director or vp at a large brand they are only in the job to preserve their own job. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what they're doing is they're 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 limiting the access of others, brighter generations, more innovative people, thinkers, right? Um, into the profession because they're a holdout. Um, they could retire, but why do that? They could find a new job, but why do that when they're comfortable and they're just sort of sitting on their, you know, their, you know, laurels. their, yeah, they're, they're just yeah, sitting on their laurels. And they're like, oh, well, I could just ride this job out until for the next 10 years. Um, so, and it's all, it's all for self-preservation. Yeah. Um, and, and by, by doing that, you, you're, you're, <laughs> that that's one of the 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 fastest paths to like stagnant yeah so um so anyways that's a so probably a longer winded answer to say well maybe right like the answer to that original question is well maybe but i don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing like if i can if i can develop others and or a program in a way that allows me to focus on that less and to go off and focus on other things, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, some people might not be operating with that same mindset uh, in part because they're beholden to the scarcity mindset. And again, like I've been there myself. I think there are a lot of people who have operated in a scarcity mindset because of the things that they've they, they have personally experienced in their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, is it's not like a, a, it's not me saying it's right or wrong, but it's me saying there, there, there's a, there's a certain level of like self-awareness that I think we all have to sort of operate within. Um, I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing if I'm setting up other people for success in a way that makes me, makes them less dependent on me. Like, that's not a bad thing. That, you know, it, it, it enables, it equips and empowers them. And it also enables and equips and allows me to go do other things. Right. And I think sometimes um, as a supervisor of somebody who is, I'm, I'm not speaking of me, I'm just like sure. somebody who is supervising somebody who has done this, that supervisor feels more comfortable elevating you to whatever the next level is, because they know that everything is going to be taken care of because you've set it up in such a way that if I do promote you to something else. The, the, the department's not going to fall apart because you are capable of really great succession. And that's, and that is what helps to get people like, in my personal opinion, to that next level, because they know that if we move you out of it, everything is still going to be able to function great. And because I know a lot of times um, we have conversations of moving up and we have a conversation with our supervisor, but in the back of the supervisor's mind, it's like, but we can't lose you because if we lose you, then, you know, what is going to happen with this? And mm -hmm. it's almost like you're, it's almost like you're shooting yourself in the foot when you don't do it. Yeah. I, I thought I had something else to like add to that, but, but I, but I mean, it, that, that, that sounds right to me. I mean, it's, um, and I think it just requires that there's a certain level of like awareness that we all have as professionals and even like managers of others 
to reduce any of the potential harm that could be that could happen as a result of that sort of like cycle that you might get yourself into. Okay, well, we are coming up on time. So I have two more questions for you. The first one is, what book are you reading right now? Besides your own. So I, I do read a lot of books. And um, I actually do have one that I'm that I've been reading for some time. And it's called Make Noise. Um, and, you know, this was uh, a gift that I got from my partner, Cindy. She's um, incredibly supportive of the things that I do. And this book is great. Uh, it, it says that it's like about, you know, creating a guide to a podcast or whatever. I'm not trying to build a, a podcast. Um, the, the book is actually more focused around storytelling, right? And mm. I, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that storytelling can be a very, um, it can be a very powerful way to get people engaged in whatever that thing is that you're doing. Storytelling you know, I, I've heard the quote before, like communications is a new power tie and storytelling is a way to communicate. Um, you know, no longer the days where you're you're coming in with your Rolex watch and your, you know, Brooks Brothers tie and your Gucci suit and all that to, to like razzle dazzle and to say, I'm here yeah. and you're going to listen to me. No, people, people have to work through others. And these are oftentimes people who are not responsible to you. And the way that you can influence others in a positive way is through more creative and compelling storytelling. Mm -hmm. So that book is about how to storytell better. I think we all have stories, um, whether they're personal stories, whether they're stories that you want to tell about the institution that you work for, whether it's a story that you're trying to tell to, say, volunteers, that you're trying to get engaged and into a call to action. But storytelling is how you do that. So that's what that book is more about. Okay, so Jerome, how can people reach you? How can they contact you? How can they get in touch with you? So I'm on social media, most of all the different social media platforms, but the one that's probably the easiest where it's probably the greatest access to me is LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So if you go to LinkedIn, type in Jerome Tenniel. I, I think I'm the only person with my name. Jerome Tennille. Um, you know, it's not like one of those other names like John Smith or whatever, which is like or Nicole Smith. Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> um, so go to LinkedIn, shoot me a note. I would love to connect. And and I think uh, you know, as you had shared, uh, Nicole, like I'm fairly accessible and I, I feel like I'm also very responsive too. Um so yeah, uh shoot me a note. I would love to connect. Well, and there you have it, everybody. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this episode of From the Suggestion Box, Navigating Feedback, the Good, the Bad, and the Say What. If you enjoyed this, please make sure to like, share, and su subscribe. Share it with somebody who you feel might really benefit from hearing what Jerome had to say. Um, and so until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>